Padre Pio, you know, his prayers like healing people, not even just immediately, he'd lay hands on people and they'd be healed, or he'd say a word and they'd be healed, but he would just even pray for them, he'd get a letter. Padre Pio was born into a poor peasant family in the rural Italian town of Pietrelcina. When he was a child, Pio told his parents his wish to become a monk, and his parents also very supported this dream of Pio. Throughout his life, Pio made important predictions for the spiritual life of Christians. Right before he passed away, he received this message from Jesus revealed the truth about human life. Along with that, the America election is about coming to the end. The next leader might be the one who very close to the portrait of the powerful man is mentioned in the Bible, and if it's true, at the end times, he will be destroyed. Join us as we follow St. Pio's step to unveil all of his warning word. Life of the Holy Saint Pio seems to have been destined to carry the mission of carrying the cross on his shoulders since he was born. Peppa, the child was born wrapped in a white veil, and that's a good sign. He will be holy, said the midwife to Pio's mother when she lifted the newborn baby in the afternoon of the May 25, 1887. Padre Pio's real name was Francesco Forgione. As a little boy, Francesco Forgione was called Franci. Franci liked to hear stories about Christ, Mary, and the saints. He used to like to remain alone, listening to distant voices, mysterious heavenly utterances, and echoes of invisible bells that sounded only for him. Padre Pio is to be stripped of all the faculties of his priestly ministry except the faculty to celebrate the Holy Mass, which he may continue to do, provided that it is done in private, within the walls of the friary, in the inner chapel, and not publicly in church. It was a difficult cross for him to bear. Instead of being angry, he obeyed and submitted to the decree. Padre Pio would spend the next several years in silence, celebrating Mass privately and accepting no visitors. He couldn't even write to his spiritual children. In spite of the immense goodness of his heart, in spite of his pure holiness, and in spite of his invaluable service to thousands of his spiritual children, Padre Pio experienced many difficult trials. Padre Pio had endured incredibly enormous suffering throughout his life, consisting of more persecution, humiliation, accusations, slanders, trials, and condemnations than one can imagine. Although he implored divine providence to remove from him those signs that caused him so many afflictions and misunderstandings, he never asked to be relieved of the pain they produced. It pleased our Lord that his faithful servant imitated him during a calvary of fifty years, to his indescribable and unbearable confusion and humiliation. The physical sufferings brought on by the stigmata, the almost superhuman efforts involved in his extraordinarily fruitful pastoral work, and the calumnies and persecutions that crucified his soul redounded to his glory, even on this earth. In 1962, dozens of bishops and archbishops participating in the Second Vatican Council visited him. On September 20, 1968, the 50th anniversary of his stigmatization, Padre Pio realized that his end was near. On the September 22nd, after his morning mass, the people acclaimed him. By half past ten, pallid and tremulous, he barely had the strength to raise his cold hands and bless the numerous crowd from the window of the old church. There was something ineffable in their joy and applause as they waved their hands and handkerchiefs in response to his greeting. In the afternoon, after the last blessing of the faithful who had attended Mass, he withdrew into his quarters. The priest in attendance tells us that at that moment, the window of Padre Pio's cell closed forever, leaving behind the memory of a man who inspired all those who approached him to call him Father. At two in the morning of the 23rd, after receiving the anointing of the sick, with a rosary in his hands, the names of Jesus and Mary on his lips, his soul soared to heaven. He was 81 years of age. A veritable mass of people came to pay their last respects to his holy remains, and the chronicles of the monastery record that what took place was not the funeral, 
but the triumph of Padre Pio. Thus began in eternity the life of one of today's most venerated saints in Italy and around the world. It was in 1973 that the cause for Padre Pio's canonization was taken up. But for the next 10 years, nothing happened because Padre Pio's name was still on the list of people condemned by the Holy Office. It was Pope John Paul II who intervened to remove the obstacles that were preventing Padre Pio from being canonized into a saint. The Pope had met Padre Pio in 1947, and since then he remained an admirer and supporter of Padre Pio. Finally, on the May 2, 1999, Pope John Paul II beatified Padre Pio, and he now became Saint Pio. We are now at the end times. One of the world's most anticipated political events is the U.S. presidential election. As a superpower, every word and action of this giant draws global attention. Each decision made by the U.S. can have substantial influence and impact on the economy, politics, and society of other nations. Therefore, who will be named the next president is a matter of worldwide concern. Currently, the name most frequently mentioned is Donald Trump. For various reasons, this wealthy man appears to be gaining an upper hand in the race for the White House, especially after his strongest opponent, Joe Biden, has ended his campaign. Along with the support flowing toward Trump, some also suggest that Trump's image aligns closely with prophecies about the Antichrist, a charismatic leader who is wealthy, influential, and possesses sharp rhetorical and reasoning skills. Once again, people are revisiting predictions about the end times that St. Padre Pio once mentioned. In the scenario where Trump is the key figure mentioned in the Bible, he will soon be overpowered by the might of God. Conversely, if Trump has no connection to the depiction of the man who will bring calamity upon the world, he will live in God's grace, strengthened by his strong faith. How about you? What do you think about this man? And before face to the last day, we have to witness the world deep into the dark. Of the more recent revelations about these days of darkness, we will mention Saint Padre Pio. On the January 26, 1950, he predicted a major and as of yet still forthcoming chastisement for the world on account of its grave sins. Keep your windows well covered. Do not look out. Light a blessed candle, which will suffice for many days. Pray the rosary. Read spiritual books. Make acts of spiritual communion. Also acts of love, which are so pleasing to us. Pray with outstretched arms or prostrate on the ground in order that many souls may be saved. Do not go outside the house. Provide yourself with sufficient food. The powers of nature shall be moved, and a rain of fire shall make people tremble with fear. Have courage. I am in the midst of you. There are proximate signs in their probable order of occurrence during these darkness days that you need to really careful. The first sign. People start to flout of church laws, false worship, irreverence and immodesty in church, fall in attendance at church, church closings, churches for sale. The second sign is the lack of charity towards others, heartlessness, indifference, divisions, contentions, godlessness, rebellion against God. They did not, do not, and will not repent. The third one. Breakdown of family life, immorality, adultery, perversion of youth in schools, immodest fashions, people concerned only with eating, drinking, dancing, and other pleasures, but gradually forget the chaste lifestyle as taught by God. We continue with the fourth sign. Civil commotions, contempt for authority, downfall of governments, confusion in high places, corruption, coup d'etat, civil war, revolution. This is exactly the moment when the whole world becomes uncontrollably chaotic. Disunity will create loopholes for nefarious people to rise. At that time, the Antichrist would reveal his power and rule the entire world. Humanity will be plunged into the darkness of lack of faith. The fifth sign, floods and droughts, crop failures, unusual weather, tornadoes, earthquakes, tidal waves, famines, epidemics, 
unknown diseases, it might appear new strains of viruses. The Bible also mentions these signs. Once nature gets angry, it is also the time when God is showing us that his day is coming very close. Satan will triumph. But after three nights, the earthquake and fire will cease. On the following day, the sun will shine again. Angels will descend from heaven and will spread the spirit of peace over the earth. A feeling of immeasurable gratitude will take possession of those who survive this terrible ordeal, the impending punishment with which God has visited the earth since creation. Before Padre Pio's Death For half the 20th century, St. Padre Pio suffered the wounds of Christ, all of them, including the cynicism of doubt and the tyranny of false witness. May you have heard about two of the Church's most revered treasures, the Shroud of Turin and the Volto Santo, the image of the holy face hidden for 400 years and believed to be the second burial cloth of Jesus, the Sudarium. There is an ancient legend that a woman offered her headcloth to wipe the face of Jesus on the way to Golgotha. When he gave it back to her, as the story has it, an impression of his face remained on the veil. What is now the sixth station of the cross has been legendary in Rome since the 8th century. The name tradition has given to that woman is Veronica, a name that appears nowhere in the gospel narrative of the Passion of Christ. The veil is believed to be one of two burial cloths of Jesus. On the morning of the resurrection, the Gospel of John reports the smaller burial cloth of Jesus, the veil covering his face, was rolled up in a place by itself, as witnessed by St. Peter and St. John. In Jewish custom in the time of Jesus, such a veil covered the faces of dignitaries, such as the high priest, in death before being entombed. It is this veil that many now believe is enshrined at Manopello, in contrast to that other, larger burial cloth, believed by many to be the Shroud of Turin. The image on the veil is not that of a dead man, however, but of a man very much alive, his eyes wide open. It is Jesus Christ, having conquered death. Paul McLeod reported in the article that Capuchin priest, Father Domenico de Sesi, formerly custodian of the shrine, was killed in an accident while visiting the Shroud of Turin in 1978. A decade earlier, however, Father Domenico wrote of a rather strange occurrence. On the morning of a September 22, 1968, Father Domenico opened the doors of the shrine and was startled to find Padre Pio kneeling in prayer before the image of the Holy Face. Padre Pio was at the same time 200 kilometers away at San Giovanni Rotondo, gravely ill and near death. It was his last known occurrence of bilocation, a phenomenon that, like his visible wounds, became a source of skepticism about Padre Pio, both in and outside of the church. In the hours before his death, Padre Pio contemplated the burial cloth of Christ. After 50 years of bearing the visible wounds of Christ, Padre Pio's own soul sought out this visible link to Jesus beyond death, not Jesus crucified, a reality Padre Pio himself had lived for 50 years, but the image of the face of the risen Christ. Those September days preceding Padre Pio's death in 1968 must have been the strangest of his life. The visible wounds became so central to his sense of self for a half century that everyone imagined he had difficulty even remembering a time when the wounds were not present. Even a great burden carried for years upon years can become a part of who and what we are. We cannot imagine Padre Pio without these wounds. We would have never even heard of Padre Pio without these wounds. So in that sense, the wounds were not for him. They were for us. Punishment for a reason. Let's pay your attention to the end of Exodus chapter 10, picking up in verse 21. We come to the penultimate plague of the next to the last of this series of ten plagues. All along we have said that God has emphasized his sovereignty in his dealings with Pharaoh through the plagues. He has shown Israel that he is the Lord and that his care is for them. He has made it very clear that his purpose in the Exodus is to bring them out of bondage in order that they might serve. 
brought out of bondage in order to serve. It is a service of fullness and freedom and holiness and blessing, but it is service. It is for the worship of the Lord that the children are being brought out of Israel. And so with this introduction, let's hear then Exodus chapter 10, beginning in verse 21. This is God's word. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, not did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore, our livestock too will go with us, not a hoof will be left behind. For we shall take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know with what we shall serve the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me, beware. Do not see my face again, for in the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, You are right. I shall never see your face again. Amen. And thus ends God's holy and inspired word. First of all, darkness is a biblical sign of God's judgment. Throughout the Old Testament and especially in the prophets, the threat of darkness is a sign of God's judgment, and in the New Testament, it continues to be a sign of God's judgment. For instance, if you were to turn with me now to Revelations chapter 16, verses 10 and 11, that's a chapter that almost seems as if John has the Exodus plagues opened before him, or we might say it this way. Undoubtedly, these plagues were memorized in the mind of the Apostle John, and he's running down these plagues in his mind, even as he reveals what God has revealed to him and writing it out in Exodus chapter 16. And here we see this plague of darkness referred to Revelation 16 verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And then further description is given. And they gowed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Interesting parallels there. Not only a play of darkness, but a lack of repentance upon the part of those who had been visited by this particular plague, just like we'll see in the case of Pharaoh here in Exodus chapter 10. But in the Bible, darkness is a sign of God's judgment. That's the first thing that we need to know about this plague of darkness. What's the significance of it? Why is it so dire? Because it is a sign of God's judgment. Secondly, let me say that darkness is specifically associated in the Bible with God's abandonment, and that is one reason it is so severe a sign of His judgment. What does the Bible teach us about our God? He is light. And so, when a judgment sign of darkness comes, it indicates His removal of Himself from a situation for blessing. He is light. When he withdraws himself and darkness is left in the wake of his withdrawal, it's a sign of his abandonment of a situation for blessing. When he withdraws, only darkness is left. In divers' way, in negligence, in persevering of it by falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit by some sudden and vehement temptation, and then listen to this phrase, by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering, even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Is that not the experience of Job? No particular sin provokes that dark providence, and yet there is this withdrawal of the light of his countenance. Well, in even a starker way, in even a more ominous way, God's withdrawal of light and his judgment in darkness shows his abandonment. This is most keenly seen on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the withdrawing of God's blessing and in this sign of darkness and judgment against Egypt, we have a foreshadowing of that darkness, that judgment, that forsakenness, that abandonment, that dereliction 
which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ endured on our behalf. So, darkness is specifically associated with abandonment in the Bible. It is a dire warning that is being given here. Egypt is being told that all the kinds, common providential provisions that God has made, are about to be withdrawn, and His judgment is about to be against her completely. Thirdly, this plague of darkness basically returns us to the situation that existed in the world, in the universe, prior to the first day of creation. Let me ask you to turn back now to Genesis chapter 1. You've caught on tonight that you're going to need to have your Bibles handy because I want you to see with your own eyes some of these connections. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. And the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. This is a description of the world prior to God structuring creative days and we're told three things. That in this state, the earth was orderless. It was chaotic. It was void. It was empty. And it was dark. There was no light. We can't survive in a totally chaotic, totally empty, totally dark world. So, God in His goodness and mercy solves this problem. Not a problem for Him, but a problem for us. Through His creative power in the days of creation, as He fills up the world so it's no longer empty, it's full as He brings order to the world, so it's no longer chaotic, but it's structured. He separated light from darkness and water from land and the upper world from the lower world and brings order and structure and He grants light. But what we see in the plague of darkness is returning us to a situation prior to the first day of creation. God is indicating that He is about to deconstruct and decreate Egypt. His hand of judgment is against Egypt. And now He is going to Egypt to, as it were, a pre-creational state. Emptiness, chaos, and darkness will characterize her. Fourth and finally, this plague of darkness shows the sovereignty of God over Ra, the sun god, the chief of the gods of Egypt. The Egyptians worshipped Ra in almost all of the palace ceremonies. Ra worship was pervasive in the land. They believed that the sunrise in the east symbolized Ra's victory over the demonic powers of the netherworld, and that sunset indicated that these forces of darkness were waging war against Ra. And then when the sun rose again, it showed that Ra had won. He was victorious over those that would challenge his rule. So, when God through Moses announces, not a day, not just the daylight hours, but three days of darkness, he is showing that the God of the Hebrews and sovereign over the chief deities over Egypt. This darkness was described in the most apocalyptic terms in verses 21 and 22. Look at the end of verse 21. It's called a darkness that may be felt. It's called a thick darkness, literally a dark darkness. In verse 22, it was characterized by an extraordinary duration. Three days this darkness would endure. So often three days is a symbolic representation in the Old Testament for the fullness of time, the completion of a particular activity. This darkness was miraculous in two ways. It was miraculous in its pervasiveness. We're told that the Egyptians couldn't even see one another, and it's even hinted at that they were unable to supply any sort of artificial remedy for this darkness. Furthermore, we are told that a distinction is made, and the mercifulness of this plague is seen in that it is manifested in a distinct way in Goshen, in the land of the Israelites. They have light in their homes. And so God shows His miraculous power in the pervasiveness of this plague and in the distinctive way in which it manifests itself. Once again, a difference is made between Israel and Egypt. So, in this plague of darkness, God is saying to Egypt, My judgment is upon you. My judgment is about to come in a way with a force that you cannot comprehend and which you will not be able to resist and which you will not be able to bear up under. So, God's prophetic warning here presents yet another opportunity for Egypt and for Pharaoh to see the error of its ways and to turn to him repenting and in humility. But this doesn't happen. 
So, in the plague of darkness, we see a portent of God's abandonment of Egypt. Not only his victory over the gods of Egypt, but the fact that shortly his final judgment will fall. That's what we see in verses 21 through 23, as this second to the last plague is described for us and commanded. If you look at verses 24 through 26, two things in particular stand out. We see Pharaoh's final bargain. Pharaoh is still bickering at this point, and he makes what will be his final offer to Moses. In the same section, verses 24 through 26, we see Moses' steadfast refusal to compromise. Again, God's sovereignty is displayed in this. God's sovereignty is seen in the dignity and the uncompromising posture of his prophet, of his representative Moses. I mean, think of it in terms of worldly power. Pharaoh has all the cards in his deck. Everything is in his favor in regard to worldly power. Yet Moses, in the face of this kind of danger, is bold in his refusal to compromise with Pharaoh. Look at verse 24. Pharaoh again changes his terms. He relents from an earlier position. Do you remember earlier in chapter 10, Pharaoh had said, Look, I'll let the men go, but the woman and the children have to stay behind. Now, he relents from that position. Over and over, Pharaoh's failed compromises show his weakness and prove God's sovereignty. Pharaoh is backing off at every point. He had bid low and his bids are getting higher every time, closer to the original directive that had been given to him by God through Moses. But Pharaoh, though his bid keeps changing, though there continue to be offers and counter-offers on the table, Pharaoh continues doggedly to refuse an unconditional surrender, and that's the key. Only this time, leave the animals. There is always some qualification with Pharaoh he will not go along with what God has told him through Moses. Now look at verse 25. This is one of the thrilling responses to a tyrant in all of the prophetic literature. Moses boldly and even royally tells Pharaoh what he is going to go. Moses tells Pharaoh what he must do. You must let us have the sacrifices. This is not the language of bargaining. This is the dictate of a monarch. And of course, Moses is speaking for the monarch. He's the representative of the monarch. He's the mediator of the monarch. And he even insinuates in this passage that in the end, it would be Egypt that provided Israel with the sacrificial material to worship the God of the Hebrews, the only true God. Pray, hope, and don't worry. Only one thing is necessary. Lift up your spirit and love God. That is what Padre Pio emphasized to all of us. Born May 25, 1887, in Pietrelcina, Italy, as Francesco Forgione, Padre Pio devoted himself to God at a very young age. Francesco began to experience ecstasies and apparitions as early as age four or five. Through more and more visions and encounters with the healing work of God, Francesco's trust in Him only continued to grow though his early life was certainly not without struggle. In 1918, Europe was ravaged by World War I and the Spanish flu. It was a year of suffering for Pio, his community, and Europe. Amidst this suffering of the world, one day in September, Padre Pio said Mass at San Giovanni Rotondo. Afterward, he received a miraculous vision. He saw someone with Christ's crucifixion wounds, after the vision, Pio realized he was physically dripping with blood. He had received the stigmata. Stigmata are the five wounds of Christ replicated in the human body. In addition to the miracle of the stigmata that he experienced, God worked through Padre Pio to perform hundreds and hundreds of miracles on others throughout his lifetime, curing people of all kinds of sicknesses. Pio even founded a hospital near San Giovanni Rotondo called home for the relief of suffering in 1956. The hospital still operates today. He also was known for his spiritual counseling to those seeking reconciliation. Pio passed away on September 23, 1968, was beatified in 1999, and soon canonized in 2002 
by Pope, now Saint, John Paul II. Again, Padre Pio is one of the great wonder workers in the history of the Church. His life was marked by extraordinary events, the stigmata, bilocation, miracles of healing and conversion, reading hearts in the confessional, and much, much more. And where did all these miracles come from? Prayer. They all came from and came back to prayer. Saint Padre Pio knew that. He knew that, in and of himself, he was nothing, and that all grace and strength came from Jesus. He knew that he needed God's help, that all the miracles that accompanied him throughout his life were the work of the living God, and that he himself was a beloved child of God. And so he recommended in his letters and in his spoken words that the faithful pray. One of his most famous quotes, in fact, is, Pray, hope, and don't worry. Coming from anyone else, that may be too easy, too smooth. Coming from the man who was marked in his own flesh by the wounds of Jesus, well, that quote was earned at the price of great suffering. That quote gained credibility when you learned of the many, many extraordinary miracles that happened when Padre Pio prayed. Further, it indicated the great many miracles that could come when we pray, when anyone prayers, if only we have faith the size of a mustard seed. Prayer. A soul arms itself by prayer for all kinds of combat. In whatever state the soul may be, it ought to pray. A soul which is pure and beautiful must pray, or else it will lose its beauty. A soul which is striving after this purity must pray, or else it will never attain it. A soul which is newly converted must pray, or else it will fall again. A sinful soul, plunged in sins, must pray so that it might rise again. There is no soul which is not bound to pray, for every single grace comes to the soul through prayer. And his sufferings indicated to us that even if our prayers appear to go unanswered, even if we must persist in the face of suffering, darkness, and confusion, grace is still flowing. God is still answering us, but sometimes his answer is to work through us, through our sufferings united with those of his Son, to bring life, grace, peace, and hope to the world. Springs of living water well up in the hearts and souls of saints, after all. Springs of living water pour forth, as they do from the heart of Jesus in the divine mercy image. The red and pale rays symbolize the graces that poured forth with the blood and water from the heart of cross on the cross. The graces that reach us in the sacraments of baptism, confession, and the Eucharist. The living water that wells up within us is meant for us and for the whole world. God's mercy, reaching out through the body of Christ, bringing light to dark places, life to dead places, and hope to the hopeless. Padre Pio showed us how to do that. Show me your hands. Do they have scars from giving? Show me your feet. Are they wounded in service? Show me your heart. Have you left a place for divine love? Through the pierced hands of Padre Pio, baptism, absolution, and the Eucharist reached the faithful. The pierced feet of Padre Pio bore him to those in need. The pierced side of Padre Pio opened the way for the love of God and neighbor. The wounded shoulder of Padre Pio marked where both Christ and he had borne a heavy cross. And so much of that cross was borne in prayer, in St. Padre Pio's extraordinarily deep and rich life of prayer and suffering for souls. He didn't just sit in the confessional waiting for penitents to arrive or preach from the pulpit expecting his words to penetrate the hearts of the faithful. No, he suffered and he prayed for the sinners of the world. And by the power of his suffering united to his prayer, the sinners of the world came. That's why he also said, Pray for the perfidious and for the fervent. Pray not just for the good people in need, but for the bad. In fact, don't just pray for the bad, pray longer for the bad people, for the undeserving, for the unworthy. And don't just pray longer, suffer for them as well. Fast and pray for the worst of sinners. And more. Fast and pray for those who drive you nuts. Fast and pray for the annoying, for the outcasts, for the intolerable. Fast and pray for the lost sheep, for the criminals and the monsters. 
for those who you think deserve what's coming to them. Try to save them by the grace of God and your intercession from the worst of fates, and encourage your friends, neighbors, and relatives to pray as well. After all, Jesus promised us through St. Faustina, let the greatest sinners place their trust in my mercy. They have the right before others to trust in the abyss of my mercy. My daughter, write about my mercy towards tormented souls. Souls that make an appeal to my mercy delight me. To such souls, I grant even more graces than they ask. I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes an appeal to my compassion. But on the contrary, I justify him in my unfathomable and inscrutable mercy. Write, Before I come as a just judge, I first open wide the door of my mercy. He who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice. We have been given one of the most powerful means of intercession imaginable through the divine mercy message and devotion and the solid assurance from God that our prayers for sinners will be heard. We need to pray the chaplet for sinners including ourselves. Venerate the divine mercy image and ask for the grace of conversion of poor sinners. And during the 3 p.m. hour of great mercy, remember the passion of Christ by which poor sinners are saved, asking for the grace of our conversion, salvation, sanctification, and healing. Pray like St. Padre Pio. Pray persistently, daily, and with love. Pray in the face of every challenge, every crisis, every failure, every cross. Pray and hope and don't worry, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we shall renew the face of the earth. Pray for me, that I may practice what I preach. I'll pray for you. He was a simple priest in southern Italy, known for having supernatural gifts, including the stigmata, the same wounds Jesus received at his crucifixion. Padre Pio was a revered saint who was bestowed with the sacred stigmata, and he bore these wounds with dignity and humility. He lived a life full of pain and suffering and endured everything in silence. The light that enabled him to overcome all hardships was thanks to his steadfast devotion to Jesus Christ. During his moments of connection with God, St. Padre Pio received revelations and made predictions about what would happen in 2025. Many of these are gradually coming true, especially when we reflect on what is happening in the world. It seems that the chaos is accelerating the fulfillment of these prophecies more than ever. A Year of Jubilee Our saint declared 2025 a year of jubilee with a papal bull. The jubilee year will begin with the opening of the holy door of St. Peter's Basilica on Christmas Eve 2024. Hope is also the central message of the coming jubilee that, in accordance with an ancient tradition, the Pope proclaims every 25 years. The theme of the Jubilee is Pilgrims of Hope, as Pio is calling on all Catholics to renew in the hope of Christ, using St. Paul the Apostle as a guide for this special year. Everyone knows what it is to hope. In the heart of each person, hope dwells as the desire and expectation of good things to come, despite our not knowing what the future may bring. Even so, uncertainty about the future may at times give rise to conflicting feelings, ranging from confident trust to apprehensiveness, from serenity to anxiety, from firm conviction to hesitation and doubt. Often we come across people who are discouraged, pessimistic and cynical about the future, as if nothing could possibly bring them happiness. For all of us, may the Jubilee be an opportunity to be renewed in hope. God's Word helps us find reasons for that hope. Taking it as our guide, let us return to the message that the Apostle Paul wished to communicate to the Christians of Rome. St. Pio has urged the faithful to pray for peace, especially amidst the wars are over the world. Jubilee years have a historical and biblical precedent, which can be found in the book of Leviticus. In the Old Testament, part of the celebration included the freeing of slaves and prisoners as well as the forgiveness of debts as manifestations of God's mercy. Pope Boniface VIII re-established the Jubilee tradition in 1300. Instead of focusing on freeing slaves, 
the Christian version offered liberation from sins and from the punishment due to sin that must be faced in purgatory. During the holy year, may the light of Christian hope illumine every man and woman as a message of God's love addressed to all. And may the church bear faithful witness to this message in every part of the world. The darkness is covering the planet. Watch the sun, the moon, and the stars carefully. When you notice they are behaving strangely and turbulently, know that the day is near. Divine judgment will fall upon them like lightning. The wicked and corrupt will be wiped out without mercy. Fire hurricanes emerge from the clouds and spread across the world, reaching every place. These hurricanes will be accompanied by various other natural disasters, violent storms, prolonged periods of bad weather, floods that destroy everything, deafening thunder, and earthquakes causing massive destruction. These tragedies will not be brief. They will last for two whole days, bringing destruction and chaos like never before. The magnitude and power of these phenomena are meant to remind people that God is in control of the universe. Now, the warning comes again with even greater urgency. The message is clear. Everyone must be ready for what is about to happen. It is essential to be spiritually and emotionally prepared as the times ahead will bring intense challenges. This is the moment to reflect on past warnings and take action to face the future with wisdom and faith. Finally, it is crucial to trust in divine protection. Those who keep their faith and follow the instructions will be safe and will not suffer the consequences of divine wrath finding preservation through obedience and trust in God. Stay together in prayer and vigilance until the angel of destruction has passed by your dwellings. Pray that these days may be shortened. Pray, do penance, and be zealous. People should kneel before a crucifix, acknowledging their sins and asking for the intercession of the Virgin Mary. There are things that we cannot avoid even if we want to. For example, immersion in darkness is an example so when it happens, what do we need to do? First, the very first is repent of your sins, which means forsake them and turn away from them. I say to you, but unless you shall do penance, you shall all likewise perish. You must be awake and acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Finally, put your trust in Christ to save you and believe in Him, and you have eternal life. Remain in the state of grace. Consecrate yourself to our Blessed Mother. She is, according to Holy Scriptures, the victor over the devil. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Our Blessed Mother is also according to the saints, doctors, and mystics of the Church, the means of protection and nourishment given to us by God, especially during the end times. Remember, fulfill your Mass obligation on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Make frequent spiritual communions. Remember to associate yourself in a special manner to the Blessed Mother while doing it. Make frequent acts of contrition. Say the Holy Rosary every day, especially the Sorrowful Mysteries. Obtain some beeswax candles. Ordinary white candles will be of no use. They must be made of beeswax. Pray and offer your sufferings for the restoration of the Church. Spread the message. Those who spread the message will be protected, but the scoffers, the skeptics, and those who dismiss the message because they are frightened will not escape the chastisement. During three day of darkness, the night will be bitterly cold. The wind will bowl and roar. Then will come lightning, thunderbolts, earthquakes. The stars and heavenly bodies will be disturbed and restless. There will be no light, but total blackness, utter dark, will envelop the entire earth. This will come suddenly like a flash. Hurricanes of fires will rain forth from heaven and spread over all the earth. Fear will seize mortals at the sight of these clouds of fire, and great will be their cries of lamentation. Many godless will burn in the open fields like withered grass. God's wrath will be poured out upon the whole world. The chastisement will be terrible such as never before, and will afflict the entire earth. If you go through those days, or haven't yet, 
you still need to keep the following things in mind, as it will happen soon. Saint Padre Pio told us to keep your windows well covered, do not look out, light a blessed candle which will suffice for many days, pray the rosary, read spiritual books, make acts of spiritual communion, also acts of love, which are so pleasing to us, pray with outstretched arms, or prostrate on the ground, in order that many souls may be saved. Do not go outside the house. Provide yourself with sufficient food. The powers of nature shall be moved, and a rain of fire shall make people tremble with fear. Blessed Anna Maria Taigi also emphasized the importance of using candles during these days. God will send two punishments. One will be in the form of wars, revolutions, and other evils. It shall originate on earth. The other will be sent from heaven. There shall come over the whole earth an intense darkness lasting three days and three nights. Nothing can be seen, and the air will be laden with pestilence which will claim mainly, but not only, the enemies of religion. It will be impossible to use any man-made lighting during this darkness except blessed candles. He, who out of curiosity, opens his window to look out, or leaves his home, will fall dead on the spot. During these three days, people should remain in their homes, pray the rosary, and beg God for mercy. Marie-Julie Jaheny of La Fraude waked everyone up. All the enemies of the church, whether known or unknown, will perish over the whole earth during that universal darkness, with the exception of a few whom God will soon convert. The air shall be infected by demons who will appear under all sorts of hideous forms. She continued, The three days of darkness will be on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Days of the Most Holy Sacrament, of the Cross and Our Lady. Three days less, one night. And hell will be loosed on earth. Thunder and lightning will cause those who have no faith or trust in God's power to die of fear. During these three days of terrifying darkness, no windows must be opened because no one will be able to see the earth and the terrible color it will have in those days of punishment without dying at once. The candles of blessed wax alone will give light during this horrible darkness. One candle alone will be enough for the duration of this night of hell. In the homes of the wicked and blasphemers, these candles will give no light. And Our Lady states, Everything will shake except the piece of furniture on which the blessed candle is burning. This will not shake. You will all gather around with the crucifix and my blessed picture. This is what will keep away this terror. During this darkness the devils and the wicked will take on the most hideous shapes. Red clouds like blood will move across the sky. The crash of the thunder will shake the earth and sinister lightning will streak the heavens out of season. The earth will be shaken to its foundations. The sea will rise, its roaring waves will spread over the continent. The earth will become like a vast cemetery. The bodies of the wicked and the just will cover the ground. Three quarters of the population of the globe will disappear. Half the population of France will be destroyed. Let's see the revelations of Marie-Julie Jaheny, which she told on June 15, 1882, through Prophecies of La Fraude of Marie-Julie Jaheny. Our Jesus told that, I forewarn you that a day will be found, and it is already appointed when there will be little sun, few stars, and no light to take a step outside of your homes, the refuges of my people. The days will be beginning to increase, days get longer on December 22nd. It will not be at the height of summer, nor during the longer days of the year, which menace summertime, but when the days are still short, means winter time. It will not be at the end of the year, but during the first months that God shall give his clear warnings. That day of darkness and lightning will be the first that he shall send to convert the impious, and to see if a great number will return to him before the great storm chastisement, which will closely follow. The darkness and lightning of that day will not cover all of France, but a part of Brittany will be tried by it. 
However, on the side on which is found the land of the mother of his Immaculate Mother will not be covered by darkness to come, up to home of Marie Julie. All the rest will be in the most terrible fright. From one night to the next, one complete day, the thunder will not cease to rumble. The fire from the lightnings will do a lot of damage, even in the closed homes where someone will be living in sin. That first day of chastisement will not take away anything from the three others, which Menas the three-day chastisement already pointed out and described. He continued, That particular day was revealed to my servant, Catherine, in the apparitions of my blessed mother, under the title, Mary Conceived Without Sin. That day is recorded in five well-sealed rolls of Sister St. Peter of Tours. That roll will remain a secret until the day when a person of God will lay her predestined hand on that which the world will have ignored, including even the inhabitants of that cloister. When everything seems hopeless for the Christian forces, God will work a wonderful miracle, or as some prophets refer to it, a great event, or a terrible event, in favor of his own. During this phenomenon, the truly holy will not be harmed, and terrible though it will be, yet we may take consolation in the fact that it will mark the end of God's chastisements. It would seem that the event mentioned vaguely by so many seers is that specified by others as three days of darkness with the sun and the moon, as it were, turning to blood. The air will be poisoned, thus killing off most of the enemies of Christ's church. During these three days, the only light available to men will be blessed candles, and one candle will burn the entire period. However, even blessed candles will not light in the houses of the godless, yet once the candle is lit by one in the state of grace, it will not burn out until the three days darkness is over. This great event will usher in peace to the troubled world. It would be a sort of reenactment of the three hours of darkness over the whole earth at Christ's crucifixion, and a preview of that which will mark the end of the reign of Antichrist. The Plague Darkness Speaking of darkness, I think I need to tell you about this story. Let's pay your attention to the end of Exodus chapter 10, picking up in verse 21. We come to the penultimate plague of the next to the last of this series of 10 plagues. All along, we have said that God has emphasized his sovereignty in his dealings with Pharaoh through the plagues. He has shown Israel that he is the Lord and that his care is for them. He has made it very clear that his purpose in the Exodus is to bring them out of bondage in order that they might serve. Brought out of bondage in order to serve. It is a service of fullness and freedom and holiness and blessing, but it is service. It is for the worship of the Lord that the children are being brought out of Israel. And so, with this introduction, let's hear then Exodus chapter 10, beginning in verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, not did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. But Moses said, You must also let you have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore our livestock too will go with us. Not a hoof will be left behind. For we shall take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know with what we shall serve the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me, beware. Do not see my face again, for in the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, You are right, I shall never see your face again. Amen. And thus ends God's holy and inspired word. First of all, darkness is a biblical sign of God's judgment. Throughout the Old Testament and especially in the prophets, the threat of darkness is a sign of God's judgment, and in the New Testament, it continues to be a sign of God's judgment. For instance, 
if you were to turn with me now to Revelations chapter 16 verses 10 and 11. That's a chapter that almost seems as if John has the Exodus plagues opened before him, or we might say it this way. Undoubtedly, these plagues were memorized in the mind of the Apostle John, and he's running down these plagues in his mind even as he reveals what God has revealed to him and writing it out in Exodus chapter 16. And here we see this plague of darkness referred to Revelation 16 verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And then further description is given. And they gowed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Interesting parallels there. Not only a play of darkness, but a lack of repentance upon the part of those who had been visited by this particular plague, just like we'll see in the case of Pharaoh here in Exodus chapter 10. But in the Bible, darkness is a sign of God's judgment. That's the first thing that we need to know about this plague of darkness. What's the significance of it? Why is it so dire? Because it is a sign of God's judgment. Secondly, let me say that darkness is specifically associated in the Bible with God's abandonment, and that is one reason it is so severe a sign of His judgment. What does the Bible teach us about our God? He is light. And so, when a judgment sign of darkness comes, it indicates His removal of Himself from a situation for blessing. He is light. When He withdraws Himself and darkness is left in the wake of His withdrawal, it's a sign of His abandonment of a situation for blessing. When He withdraws, only darkness is left. In divers' way, in negligence, in persevering of it by falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit by some sudden and vehement temptation, and then listen to this phrase, by God's withdrawing the light of His countenance and suffering, even such as fear Him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Is that not the experience of Job? No particular sin provokes that dark providence and yet there is this withdrawal of the light of his countenance. Well, in even a starker way, in even a more ominous way, God's withdrawal of light and his judgment in darkness shows his abandonment. This is most keenly seen on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, because in the withdrawing of God's blessing and in this sign of darkness and judgment against Egypt, we have a foreshadowing of that darkness, that judgment, that forsakenness, that abandonment, that dereliction, which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ endured on our behalf. So, darkness is specifically associated with abandonment in the Bible. It is a dire warning that is being given here. Egypt is being told that all the kinds, common providential provisions that God has made, are about to be withdrawn, and His judgment is about to be against her completely. Thirdly, this plague of darkness basically returns us to the situation that existed in the world, in the universe, prior to the first day of creation. Let me ask you to turn back now to Genesis chapter 1. You've caught on tonight that you're going to need to have your Bibles handy because I want you to see with your own eyes some of these connections. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. And the earth was formless, and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. This is a description of the world prior to God structuring creative days, and we're told three things. That in this state, the earth was orderless, it was chaotic, it was void, it was empty, and it was dark. There was no light. We can't survive in a totally chaotic, totally empty, totally dark world. So, God in His goodness and mercy solves this problem, not a problem for Him, but a problem for us through His creative power in the days of creation as He fills up the world so it's no longer empty, it's full, as He brings order to the world so it's no longer chaotic, but it's structured. He separated light from darkness and water from land and the upper world from the lower world and brings order and structure and He grants light. But what we see in the plague of darkness is returning us to a situation prior to the first day of creation. God is indicating that He is about to deconstruct 
and decreed Egypt. His hand of judgment is against Egypt, and now he is going to Egypt to, as it were, a pre-creational state. Emptiness, chaos, and darkness will characterize her. Fourth and finally, this plague of darkness shows the sovereignty of God over Ra, the sun god, the chief of the gods of Egypt. The Egyptians worshipped Ra in almost all of the palace ceremonies. Ra worship was pervasive in the land. They believed that the sunrise in the east symbolized Ra's victory over the demonic powers of the netherworld, and that sunset indicated that these forces of darkness were waging war against Ra. And then when the sun rose again, it showed that Ra had won. He was victorious over those that would challenge his rule. So, when God through Moses announces, not a day, not just the daylight hours, but three days of darkness, he is showing that the God of the Hebrews is sovereign over the chief deities over Egypt. This darkness was described in the most apocalyptic terms in verses 21 and 22. Look at the end of verse 21. It's called a darkness that may be felt. It's called a thick darkness, literally a dark darkness, in verse 22. It was characterized by an extraordinary duration. Three days this darkness would endure. So often, three days is a symbolic representation in the Old Testament for the fullness of time, the completion of a particular activity. This darkness was miraculous in two ways. It was miraculous in its pervasiveness. We're told that the Egyptians couldn't even see one another, and it's even hinted at that they were unable to supply any sort of artificial remedy for this darkness. Furthermore, we are told that a distinction is made, and the mercifulness of this plague is seen in that it is manifested in a distinct way in Goshen, in the land of the Israelites. They have light in their homes. And so God shows his miraculous power in the pervasiveness of this plague and in the distinctive way in which it manifests itself. So, in the plague of darkness, we see a portent of God's abandonment of Egypt. Not only his victory over the gods of Egypt, but the fact that shortly his final judgment will fall. That's what we see in verses 21 through 23, as the second to the last plague is described for us and commanded. When everything seems hopeless for the Christian forces, God will work a wonderful miracle, or as some prophets refer to it, a great event, or a terrible event, in favor of his own. During this phenomenon, the truly holy will not be harmed, and terrible though it will be, yet we may take consolation in the fact that it will mark the end of God's chastisements. It would seem that the event mentioned vaguely by so many seers is that specified by others as three days of darkness with the sun and the moon, as it were, turning to blood. The air will be poisoned, thus killing off most of the enemies of Christ's church. During these three days, the only light available to men will be blessed candles, and one candle will burn the entire period. However, even blessed candles will not light in the houses of the godless, Yet, once the candle is lit by one in the state of grace, it will not burn out until the three days' darkness is over. This great event will usher in peace to the troubled world. It would be a sort of reenactment of the three hours of darkness over the whole earth at Christ's crucifixion, and a preview of that which will mark the end of the reign of Antichrist. In the days of darkness, his elect shall not sleep, as did the disciples in the Garden of Olives. They shall pray incessantly, and they shall not be disappointed in him. He shall gather his elect. Hell will believe itself to be in possession of the entire earth, but he shall reclaim it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed by thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this daily our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Pray, hope, and don't worry. Padre Pio was an apostle of the Rosary. He loved immensely this devotional practice, which he recited several times a day, and always carried a holy rosary wrapped around his hand or arm. 
Even at his death, he held the rosary in his hand. As we well know, the rosary is the most widespread devotional and contemplative prayer recited by Christians all over the world, especially for the possibility attributed to it of receiving indulgences, thanks to the intercession of Our Lady. And that is exactly what he wants us to do in 2025. Only one thing is necessary, lift up your spirit and love God. That is what Padre Pio emphasized to all of us. Born May 25, 1887 in Pietrelcina, Italy, as Francesco Forgione, Padre Pio devoted himself to God at a very young age. Francesco began to experience ecstasies and apparitions as early as age four or five. Through more and more visions and encounters with the healing work of God, Francesco's trust in him only continued to grow, though his early life was certainly not without struggle. In 1918, Europe was ravaged by World War I and the Spanish flu. It was a year of suffering for Pio, his community, and Europe. Amidst this suffering of the world, one day in September, Padre Pio said Mass at San Giovanni Rotondo. Afterward, he received a miraculous vision. He saw someone with Christ's crucifixion wounds. After the vision, Pio realized he was physically dripping with blood. He had received the stigmata. Stigmata are the five wounds of Christ replicated in the human body. In addition to the miracle of the stigmata that he experienced, God worked through Padre Pio to perform hundreds and hundreds of miracles on others throughout his lifetime, curing people of all kinds of sicknesses. Pio even founded a hospital near San Giovanni Rotondo called Home for the Relief of Suffering in 1956. The hospital still operates today. He also was known for his spiritual counseling to those seeking reconciliation. Pio passed away on September 23, 1968, was beatified in 1999, and soon canonized in 2002 by Pope, now Saint, John Paul II. Again, Padre Pio is one of the great wonder workers in the history of the church. His life was marked by extraordinary events, the stigmata, bilocation, miracles of healing and conversion, reading hearts in the confessional, and much, much more. And where did all these miracles come from? Prayer. They all came from and came back to prayer. Saint Padre Pio knew that. He knew that in and of himself, he was nothing and that all grace and strength came from Jesus. He knew that he needed God's help, that all the miracles that accompanied him throughout his life were the work of the living God, and that he himself was a beloved child of God. And so he recommended in his letters and in his spoken words that the faithful pray. One of his most famous quotes, in fact, is, pray, hope, and don't worry. Pray, hope, and don't worry. Coming from anyone else, that may be too easy, too smooth. Coming from the man who was marked in his own flesh by the wounds of Jesus? Well, that quote was earned at the price of great suffering. That quote gained credibility when you learned of the many, many extraordinary miracles that happened when Padre Pio prayed. Further, it indicated the great many miracles that could come when we pray. When anyone prays, if only we have faith the size of a mustard seed. Prayer. A soul arms itself by prayer for all kinds of combat. In whatever state the soul may be, it ought to pray. A soul which is pure and beautiful must pray, or else it will lose its beauty. A soul which is striving after this purity must pray, or else it will never attain it. A soul which is newly converted must pray, or else it will fall again. A sinful soul, plunged in sins, must pray so that it might rise again. There is no soul which is not bound to pray, for every single grace comes to the soul through prayer. And his sufferings indicated to us that even if our prayers appear to go unanswered, even if we must persist in the face of suffering, darkness, and confusion, grace is still flowing. God is still answering us, but sometimes his answer is to work through us, through our sufferings united with those of his Son, to bring life, grace, peace, and hope to the world. Springs of living water well up in the hearts and souls of saints, after all. 
springs of living water pour forth as they do from the heart of Jesus in the divine mercy image. The red and pale rays symbolize the graces that poured forth with the blood and water from the heart of cross on the cross. The graces that reach us in the sacraments of baptism, confession, and the Eucharist. The living water that wells up within us is meant for us and for the whole world. God's mercy, reaching out through the body of Christ, bringing light to dark places, life to dead places, and hope to the hopeless. Padre Pio showed us how to do that. Show me your hands. Do they have scars from giving? Show me your feet. Are they wounded in service? Show me your heart. Have you left a place for divine love? Through the pierced hands of Padre Pio, baptism, absolution, and the Eucharist reached the faithful. The pierced feet of Padre Pio bore him to those in need. The pierced side of Padre Pio opened the way for the love of God and neighbor. The wounded shoulder of Padre Pio marked where both Christ and he had borne a heavy cross. And so much of that cross was borne in prayer, in St. Padre Pio's extraordinarily deep and rich life of prayer and suffering for souls. He didn't just sit in the confessional, waiting for penitents to arrive, or preach from the pulpit, expecting his words to penetrate the hearts of the faithful. No, he suffered and he prayed for the sinners of the world. And by the power of his suffering united to his prayer, the sinners of the world came. That's why he also said, pray for the perfidious and for the fervent. Pray not just for the good people in need, but for the bad. In fact, don't just pray for the bad. Pray longer for the bad people, for the undeserving, for the unworthy. And don't just pray longer, suffer for them as well. Fast and pray for the worst of sinners. And more, fast and pray for those who drive you nuts. Fast and pray for the annoying, for the outcasts, for the intolerable. Fast and pray for the lost sheep, for the criminals and the monsters, for those who you think deserve what's coming to them. Try to save them by the grace of God and your intercession from the worst of fates. And encourage your friends, neighbors, and relatives to pray as well. After all, Jesus promised us through St. Faustina, let the greatest sinners place their trust in my mercy. They have the right, before others, to trust in the abyss of my mercy. My daughter, write about my mercy towards tormented souls. Souls that make an appeal to my mercy delight me. To such souls, I grant even more graces than they ask. I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes an appeal to my compassion. But on the contrary, I justify him in my unfathomable and inscrutable mercy. Right, before I come as a just judge, I first open wide the door of my mercy. He who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice. We have been given one of the most powerful means of intercession imaginable through the divine mercy message and devotion and the solid assurance from God that our prayers for sinners will be heard. We need to pray the chaplet for sinners including ourselves, venerate the divine mercy image, and ask for the grace of conversion of poor sinners. And during the 3 p.m. hour of great mercy, remember the passion of Christ by which poor sinners are saved, asking for the grace of our conversion, salvation, sanctification, and healing. Pray like St. Padre Pio. Pray persistently, daily, and with love. Pray in the face of every challenge, every crisis, every failure, every cross. Pray and hope and don't worry. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we shall renew the face of the earth. Pray for me that I may practice what I preach. I'll pray for you.